Hi everyone, I'm Max from AFM. Welcome to the Pilot Training Connect podcast, where we interview individuals from the pilot training industry to learn more about their organization and their views. Every week we invite an industry leader to sit down with us, and this week I have the great pleasure to be joined by David Kolber, Director of Aviation Marketing at Resitco. Resitco is a lesser of training aircraft primarily in the United States, and we look forward to learning more about their activities from David. David, welcome to the Pilot Training Connect podcast. Thanks for having me, Max. Um, so I know there is, uh, David, I know there's huge demand for training aircraft at the moment and for some of the solutions that you're providing. Can you give us an overview of who is Resitco and what services you provide? Yeah, absolutely. So Resitco uh, is a 40-year-old privately held transportation equipment lessor. So we have two core verticals. One uh, side of that is rail equipment, so uh, rail cars and locomotives in the US. And then we have our aviation vertical. Um, and the aviation side, up until last year, our core focus, and it remains our core focus, is leasing mid to end of life commercial aircraft uh, and engines. However, last year we expanded our product offering by moving into the training space. The you know, pilot shortage is well publicized. Uh, we have been hearing from our cust uh, airline customers uh, for the past several years about the pilot shortage. And so uh, a couple of years ago, we started looking into the training space and how the various training providers, mainly flight schools, are financing their equipment. We learned a lot during that process and we learned that flight schools do not have the same access to capital and financing structures that airlines do. Uh, so we looked at a few of the providers that uh, did that do provide operating le uh, leasing structures in that space. And last year we acquired the assets of Brown Aviation Lease, which was a uh, operating leasing company for flight schools. They had 30-ish aircraft on lease to uh, flight schools across the country, a couple orders. And since then, we've grown by uh, placing direct orders with the manufacturers, uh, stepping into orders that other schools uh, have placed, and picking up aircraft on the secondhand market and leasing them to schools. Uh, so our, our key product is the operating lease. It's not a lease back uh, that lots of schools are familiar where the owner has you know has an air a local owner has an aircraft they you know give it to the local flight school and that flight school manages it and there's a you know revenue sharing but the the uh the owner has to pay for all costs this is an operating lease structure uh and the flight school in this case uh is responsible for all costs but they keep all the revenue uh and so it's really tailored for flight schools that uh fly a lot and are focused on the professional uh, uh, pilot uh, training programs, um, as opposed to maybe the the Part 61 hobbyists, uh, where your aircraft aren't flying that much. Okay, um, as there's as you've mentioned, uh, you know there's a lot of demand for pilots. There's a lot of demand for training aircraft. So if I'm a flight school leader, mm -hmm. and um, I have this demand. Uh, I know you're uh, you're offering operating leases. Uh, mm -hmm. What kind of equipment are you offering operating leases on? So that's the challenge right now. Uh, you and I were just discussing this right before the call. It is very difficult to find aircraft. Um, we have new aircraft coming next year, but they're all committed. So the way that I am growing and providing solutions in the near term uh, is two ways. One is purchase leasebacks uh, from existing schools if they have uh, aircraft that they own that they want to extract capital of out of, I've, I've acquired them and leased them back immediately. Uh, alternatively, I have worked with schools to find aircraft on the secondhand market where we step in and acquire, and then upon acquisition, that school leases the aircraft for me. That's really the only way at the moment, given the current huge um, demand supply imbalance in the aircraft space, that uh, we have to uh, you know, offer schools at the moment. 
Okay. And and you you mentioned it uh, this interesting dynamic between the demand and supply imbalance. Um yep. you're very well connected in the space. You are very knowledgeable. You've Rizitko has done a lot of uh, research uh in this uh, segment. Why is there this imbalance between demand and supply, specifically maybe also looking at the supply side. Can you share some more uh, industry knowledge on that? Yeah, I think the biggest takeaway is just the size, uh, the, the composition of the training aircraft fleet. If you just look at data from Gamma and you look at single engine piston deliveries going back to 1962, from 1962 to 1992, a 30-year span, 212,000 uh, single-engine piston aircraft were delivered. Uh, you know, during that period, at the peak, it was 14 to 15,000 aircraft per year. Between 92 and 2022, uh, only 38,000 were delivered, and you know, 1,500 per year. And if you narrow down within that. The, those numbers, not all of those aircraft are training aircraft. Some of those are, you know, more, you know, uh, more complex and uh, higher tech models for uh, personal use. Uh, so we've the, the size of the fl aging aged fleet is just massive, and I think we we're now in that large replacement uh, cycle, but the manufacturers are not building uh, in the same numbers that they used to. And so it is very difficult to get aircraft. Uh, if you're looking for a glass cockpit, any type of aircraft that's that's been built within the past 20 years, if that aircraft makes it to the market uh, to a public you know site at all, it's it's available for days, if not hours. These aircraft are just getting soaked up uh, instant instantly. Yeah, and and is is that maybe also like. Um... Uh, one of the great features of Rizitko that, um, you know, uh, you're a team which is constantly uh, scouring the secondhand market. Uh, and, you know, whereas maybe some uh, flight training organizations, some flight schools don't have uh, that visibility. And so um, maybe are able to identify aircraft through you a lot simpler than if they were themselves going out there and, you know, trying to scour uh the globe for for specific training aircraft that they might be seeking yeah absolutely i mean i'm i'm talking with people uh every day uh both privately uh, and also looking at the public sites and we're just constantly watching for aircraft uh, and looking for targets to uh, to acquire and so that is one of our our strengths and uh while our desire is to stick to the newer aircraft on the piston side we're not opposed to looking at uh, used aircraft um, uh, you know, within the 20 age range. Okay. And and what about, let's say once again, I'm a flight school leader. I'm looking mm. to add more uh, training aircraft to my fleet. Is mm. there a minimum and maximum uh, 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 fleet deal size uh, that is of uh, uh, that kind of Rizitko uh, operates in? No, uh, it depends on the, the school. And the underwriting that we perform, if you're a smaller school, we may, might you know, start with a one aircraft deal. But if you're a larger, more well-established school, we have the capability to do um, significantly significant size deals, uh, 15, 20, 25 aircraft. Okay. And, and uh, let's say once again, I am the same flight school leader, I'm interested mm -hmm. to get more training aircraft. I speak to uh, Rizitko uh, about it, or maybe I'm interested to free up some some capital of my existing fleet. Um, what are the things that you would uh, kind of look at other than uh, kind of the underwriting when it comes to the um, existing fleet, the operations of the flight school and, and such factors? Yeah, I have a couple key questions that I like to ask flight schools. You know, first and foremost is, what are you charging uh, for your zero to um, CFI program? Uh, and have you increased prices recently? That's a huge factor for me because you know we've all experienced it with supply chain issues, inflation, interest rates, costs are going up for everyone. And due to the uh, 
significant amount of flight schools in this country. I think there's 1600 private schools, not including the university system. I think that has slowed the uh, ticket price increases for training. And these aircraft are just getting more and more expensive, not even factoring in all your other costs. So uh, I, I want to see that schools are, are you know, moving along with um, to the extent that they can with the market in terms of increasing price. I want to see operating history, how long you've operated the school. Uh, I'm very curious to know if you have relationships with airlines, the feeder programs, uh, and utilization. Uh, uh, you know, utilization is key on these aircraft. Again, given the cost, you have to be operating 80 plus, 100, ideally 100 plus Hobbs hours a month. Uh, for it to make sense at these newer aircraft prices. Yeah, uh, quite interesting. You make the point on utilization. Um, so just for everyone who's listening and, and for you, David, to uh, have knowledge on this. Uh, at AFM, we're currently running a, a anonymous survey uh, with uh, flight school leaders globally uh, mm -hmm. to get their uh, input on what their uh, actual utilization is per single engine aircraft per month, uh, mm -hmm. what they think their maximum uh, mm -hmm. uh, utilization is on that uh, aircraft and what they think the industry benchmark is. We've mm -hmm. already started receiving the first inputs and it is very surprising to see kind of how people um, view utilization on an equipment, which is pretty much the same equipment in the US as it is anywhere else in the world, but of course, um, you know, might have some other operating uh, limitations um, in regards to it. Um, I'm very interested to see the results of that survey. I'm uh, <laughs> I'm holding my breath on that one. Uh, you know, I, I, I've spoken with schools that uh, claim to operate 150 to 200 hours per month per aircraft, and that's fantastic, but they seem to be out. Uh, that seems to be an outlier. Uh, from what I've seen. Uh, I haven't canvassed the entire flight school community yet though, so I'm, I'm not sure, but you know, that's what I would love to see out of at least the professional training uh, pilot organizations, uh, you know, that type of numbers. But I understand, you know, I'm not an operator of a flight school, but I understand the challenges and the maintenance programs of these aircraft, the 100 hour check, you know, puts you down and the intervals on these engines are not as great as commercial aircraft engines. Uh, so, uh, I, you know, th there's I certainly under understand and respect the challenges of operating at a cadence like that. And you're bound by the weather, uh, which is a, you know, another challenge. So, yeah, yeah. So I can already give some uh, a couple of indications of, of this uh, based on the preliminary um, input that we've received. Um, we've received um, flight schools. Once again, this is on a global level, uh, which are utilizing the aircraft at uh, at the lower end of the scale, um, 50 to 60 hours, and they think that, uh, or they target uh, um, uh, a target utilization, and they think where the industry uh, uh, benchmarks is at 75 hours per aircraft per single engine aircraft per month. And then, uh, similar to, uh, I can just echo what you've just said. On the other end of the extreme, we have seen some which are operating uh, 200, 200 plus hours uh, per month per single engine aircraft. So really a wide uh, kind of range. But we will we will put it out on AFM um, fairly shortly. Mm -hmm. um, for uh, for Rosetco, you mentioned that uh, Rosetco now has been active in this. Uh, specifically flight training operating lease space for uh, uh, over a year and a half. Uh, can you just share with with everyone listening, how has the uptake been, um, your uh, current um, profile of customers? Because you've mentioned also in terms of deal size, there's not, you know, you're you're fairly open to having discussions with uh, with flight training organizations on different deal sizes. So what are the, what are the different profiles of flight schools that have kind of worked with Rosetco? Uh, our customers, without naming them, range from uh, smaller private uh, flight schools, but are focused on the uh, professional pilot, pilot training up to major university clients. And we work with you know, both of those segments and each of them have their unique aspects. You know, working with major universities, sometimes if they're publicly funded, have uh, unique uh, requirements. 
uh, that uh, are challenging to address, but we find our way around that. And the private uh, segment is also interesting. Uh, they have their own their own uh, set of challenges. Uh, you know, if we just look at the overall global aviation uh, sector, airlines right now are, are doing fantastic. Uh, revenue is up, profit is up. They've recovered from COVID. Traffic is not quite pre-COVID levels, but because of the lack of capacity, they're they're doing quite well. Uh, the private schools, from the financials that I've seen, again, I've only seen a limited subset, uh, that recovery has not shown yet in the financials. I'm hearing lots of good news this year about record numbers of intakes of students, um, but I haven't seen it yet in the financials, and I hope to see it soon. Uh, and that goes back to more my comment about, you know, is the pricing correct for this uh, this uh, you know training environment that we're in, where the uh, the airlines are just desperate for pilots, uh, and uh, how can they help support uh, schools possibly financially? Uh, David, once again, I can only echo uh, what what you've said. The recovery in terms of a large part of the flight training industry from a financial sustainability standpoint has i haven't seen it yet uh, based on financials that i've seen i've actually seen on a global uh global level uh especially in countries where they don't have the 1500 hour rule like in the us that mm -hmm. um when there was an increase in training um uh, because the training wasn't uh, sold at uh, above cost point uh, uh actually the training was being done at a loss uh, on a per student basis, which then, you know, puts the flight training organizations uh, more into depth, you know, deteriorates their balance sheet. And yeah. uh, I've seen I've seen quite a few uh, schools close um, across the world due to financial um, uh, unsustainability or due to them having enough students, them having enough uh, aircraft, but them not having enough flight instructors. Yeah. So um, it is uh, it is a, a really interesting uh, time. You as a as a lesser of training aircraft, when you look at the kind of key challenges that um, flight training uh, organizations might be facing uh, over the coming year to two years, what are kind of the key critical areas that you're seeing? Well, putting aside getting your hands on aircraft, which we already discussed, uh, it's some of the same issues that you just mentioned. It's uh, keeping and retaining um, instructors. That's a huge issue. As soon as instructor hits 1500, boom, they're gone. Uh, even mechanics. It, we, we talk about the pilot shortage all the time, but <laughs> there's a huge mechanic shortage out there. And if you are a flight school in a large city that uh, happens to have a large airline nearby, you're competing against airline wages for your mechanics, and that's really difficult. Uh, you know, so keeping staff on uh, on board is challenging, and you know, obviously you potentially have to you know increase pay. And yet another cost input that goes up. Uh, lead times on maintenance is still extremely challenging. It, engines, you almost have to plan for engine overhauls a year in advance. Uh, something that I don't think was quite the case uh, pre-COVID. Uh, I mean, you know, typically I don't have to uh, touch uh, the aircraft that we own, but, you know, I, I have one aircraft on the ground right now and just trying to get some light maintenance done has been has been pulling teeth, just calling various shops. Uh, you know, I'm willing to fly it anywhere. You know, the best uh, response I got this week was maybe someone could look at it in a month, but some people were, you know, six to eight months before they were even willing to look at it for just some very light maintenance. So it, it's challenging out there to get support. Uh, for these uh, for these schools, and you have to have a a well run machine as a flight school, and you know do as much of the maintenance in house so you can control some of these variables. You know, uh, um, to give you a couple of indicators from a global perspective as well, for engine overhaul before the pandemic, um, let's say 2017 2018, uh, for single engine um, certain uh, you know. A certain type of engines, you're looking at around um, you know, like like combing engine. You're looking at around like uh, twenty five to thirty thousand US for an engine overhaul. Yeah. Now uh, I know in the US it's high thirties, touching forties. Yeah. Um, yeah. Globally, 
so this is something uh, quite interesting. Globally, still, a lot of training organizations are sending their uh, engines for overhaul to the US or to uh, you know certain developed nations. And there's the shipping on top of that. Plus, there's also a premium that is being charged by uh, engine overhaul facilities for those customers. So you've had a pretty much the doubling of engine overhaul costs for um, for a lot of um, countries which are not, uh, let's say, you know, in the US or in in uh, in other certain areas of the world, which once again is leading to financial um, uh, unsustainability within the flight training yeah. sector, which once again then means the US has a key advantage because it has enough flight instructors due to the 1500 hour rule, and it yeah. is close to the supply chain uh, to the origin of the supply chain. So I think flight yeah. schools in the US are going to see an increasing amount of demand, not only from the US, but international, and will need an increasing amount of training aircraft. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's a good time to be a maintenance provider uh, at the moment. Yeah. So so um, where do you see Resit go in uh, two to three years time? Uh, where I see us various versus where I want to be is a little bit different. Again, just due to the challenge of getting aircraft. We have contracted deliveries for next year of 26. We don't have anything for 25. We have a dozen for 2026. So that'll take us up into the 70s. So any other additional growth, uh, you know, is pipeline growth that we'll have to develop and would love to be north of 100 aircraft, uh, if not larger. We have the capability to be much larger than that. It's just trying to find the right deals. We're not growing for the sake of growth we still have to find uh, you know uh, deals that make sense and uh, you know for both us and our you know customers and that's a challenge right now especially on the second hand market I, you know I mentioned it before but uh, we are seeing dynamics on these assets that we have not seen in our 40 year operating history for aviation or rail assets to see aircraft appreciate over such a long period of time or vintage is you know, something that we've never, never witnessed before. Uh, we've seen appreciation in small gaps. You know, uh, maybe there was a, you know, uh, exogenous event, aircraft values went down. If you pick them up at the time and then, you know, demand recovered, great, you, you know, uh, you know big increase in values. However, for uh, 10, 12 year old aircraft to sell well over uh, their original purchase price, or even the aircraft built in the 70s and 80s, uh, trading over and above their original purchase price. Uh, never seen that in transportation equipment uh, before. And that's a unique situation to be in. There's good data points to suggest that that will continue, but it's, you know, you're walking on a, on a tightrope. <laughs> uh, and we just, you know, we have to adjust to that and see if it makes sense. It's it's nothing we've ever built into our business model where you have appreciation on an inherently an asset that goes down to zero, especially in the training environment where there's, you know, a lot more time put on these aircraft versus a privately owned aircraft that's, you know, flies 50 hours a year. So it's, it's, uh, I think we're, we're learning as we go a little bit and we're, we're being cautious. Okay, it it is fascinating. I have to say, it is. Uh, it's it almost sounds like a great new investment alternative uh, alternative investment class. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. my my final question to you, David, is for flight schools which are looking to grow their fleet, but mm -hmm. which might not have the uh the capital um to do it right now. When is the best time for them to reach out to you? Uh, to uh, discuss their fleet growth plans? Uh, right away. I, you know, we need to, most of the manufacturers are, are sold out through 2025. They're selling into 2026. If you place a large enough order, you might, you know, might get some earlier slots. But if you're trying to do uh, 510 aircraft, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're talking 2026 at this point for the big guys and, and the small uh, or the you know, newer guys, uh, or maybe the manufacturers that are popular in Europe, uh, but not so much in the US, uh, you can get aircraft a little bit sooner. Uh, so if you're not looking for large quantities, 
However, you know, the US training environment uh, are dominated by the three, four major manufacturers. Uh, so uh, it requires getting comfortable with a new asset uh, asset type and making sure that you can support it. And uh, so that, that requires a lot of planning. And I think that's been a shift as well in terms of uh, the lead times of getting aircraft if you're looking for new aircraft uh, to plan three, uh, three years out. Uh, I don't think that was the case again pre-COVID, um, but that's you know something we see all the time on the commercial side. We're not buyers of brand new commercial aircraft, but you know lead times for that go to the end of the end of the decade. Uh, so that's yeah. the way the airlines have to think about it. And so flight schools are now starting to get into that territory a little bit. Okay, and and how can uh, flight school uh, leaders reach you? How can they get in contact with you? So right now the best way is through our uh, main website www.residco.com uh, it's got my email and phone number we are going to separate the brand for our piston activity and we're going to have a new website for that uh, coming out in the next couple of months and then you know that'll set some you know more customer uh, you know facing and so we will differentiate the brands of the piston leasing uh, versus our core activities of you know the commercial aircraft space and the rail side okay Fantastic. Um, David, thank you so much for sharing your insights with uh, everyone who is listening and myself today. Really fascinating. And um, yeah, as uh, just to reiterate again, if anyone is looking for more training aircraft, the best time to contact David is right now when you're listening <laughs> because each and every day that uh, you wait uh, might add not just a day, but potentially weeks or months or, or years, uh, much yeah. longer yeah, until you get that aircraft. Thank you very much, David. Thank you, Max. Uh...